When Washington, D.C. was originally founded, it was conceived of as a, a perfect square. Congress had given George Washington the ability to make a square 10, squ 10 miles on each side and to put it somewhere where it was more or less half in Virginia and half in Maryland. I'm sure you all know all of this. Uh, you learned it in middle school civics probably. I learned it this week and so I'm excited about it. <laughs> he could have placed the, you know, the, the square at any area he wanted to along the Potomac, but he didn't choose it haphazardly. George Washington specifically set it in a place that it would include two potential ports, now Alexandria and, and Georgetown. He designed the square in such a way, that's why it's kind of at an angle if you look at a map, in such a way that both Georgetown and Alexandria would be part of it under the idea that the federal government would have to buy and sell things in order to make money. <laughs> if only he knew. Well, what was conceived of as one unified city never developed that way at all. George Washington couldn't have, have foreseen this. Instead, two separate cities grew up around the two ports, Georgetown and Alexandria. And the two cultures became different. As time went on, the two cultures became more and more different. Even though they technically were no longer parts of the state, some of the customs of their respective states still carried on. And the most particular one was towards black people. In Georgetown, which was part of Maryland, African Americans could go wherever they wanted to. They had somewhat freedom of movement. And that's why Georgetown developed as an industrial port and became a very urban kind of setting and became one of the, the most, uh, one of the cities that had more black people with freedom in it than any other American city. It became a center of, of African-American culture. Not so in Alexandria. To show the contrast, Alexandria had one of the America's largest slave trading markets was right there. That port was used essentially for slavery and agriculture. And so as Alexandria grew out, it grew to the south. And as Georgetown grew out, it grew to the north. And so you had these two different cities, both inside of the, the district, that had almost nothing in common with each other. Well, there was a period of time where some business leaders tried to pass legislation and tried to pass laws that would help commerce inside of the district. And uh, it became very, very difficult. Uh, ostensibly, Congress was supposed to govern Washington, D.C. Uh, but they had better things to do and were unable to, to really put their focus into Washington, D.C. And so these group of business leaders tried to pass laws piecemeal by bringing them first to the government that had developed in Georgetown. And once Georgetown would negotiate the law, they'd have to present it before their own council and it would be approved and it would become the law of Georgetown. And those same leaders would have to travel across the river and go down to Alexandria and present the exact same legislation all over again. And it turned out that the district had two governments, one in Georgetown, one in Alexandria, three if you count Congress, but you're welcome to if you want. <laughs> The district really had two governments, and so every piece of legislation had to go through the exact same process two times in front of two different people to make the exact same effect. Eventually, during the Mexican-American War, Congress gave up trying to oversee uh, the district and let the Virginia side of the water secede back to Virginia, which is why the district is so oddly shaped today. And we see testimony of this even driving up to D.C. You pass, you know, historic Alexandria, and then you see all the new buildings that fill out the space to D.C., and then you cross into historic D.C. What does that have to do with our passage this morning? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I hope that as you read this this morning, your mind was taken back to the, the feeding of the 5,000 earlier in Mark chapter 6. It was only a few pages ago, a few weeks ago we looked at that. And you see, I'm sure, these two miracles are almost identical. They're, they're very, very similar. Jesus went through the same process, the same miracle, two times in very similar ways, but in front of two different groups of people. He had to do it both times to make the same point. As you think of these two miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 and uh, Mark 6 and the feeding of the 4,000 here in Mark 8, you have to have your mind go to the fact that they're very, very similar. In fact, I counted 11 similarities between the two. They both happen in a deserted place. They both begin, they both feature Jesus asking the disciples to find food for the crowd. In both cases, the disciples don't know where to go to find food. In both cases, Jesus asks them, how many loaves do you have? In both cases, Jesus sits the crowd down. In both cases, Jesus gives thanks for the bread. In both cases, Jesus then lifts up the bread and breaks it. In both cases, he feeds thousands of people with very little provision. In both cases, he performs an impossible miracle for the crowd. And then in both cases, he then gets out on a boat and immediately departs. 
Their similarities are, are striking. There are a few differences between these two miracles, though, that I think are also important. And for example, in the first feeding, he took five loaves, and in the second feeding, he had seven loaves. You're not going to be quizzed on that later. You don't need to remember it. I just thought you'd like to know. It's a different kind of fish between the two feedings. In the first feeding, he used what today is called St. Peter's fish. The, if you're in Israel, it's the common fish that, that you would eat there. In the second feeding, he used what would be our equivalent of sardines. The first feeding was 5,000 men, and the parallel accounts lets us know that there were countless women and children involved. I mean, upwards of 20,000 people were fed. The second feeding is 4,000 people, and the, the word that Mark uses lets us know that it's all the people, all the people total, men, women, children, everybody who was there totaled 4,000. So 20,000 one time, 4,000 the second time. The first feeding was on green grass. The second feeding, he had them sit on the ground, which is a small difference unless you're the one doing the sitting, <laughs> then it's a, an important difference. The first time Jesus split them into groups of 50, the second time he just had the whole crowd sit down. The first time the number of leftovers was 12, the second time it was seven. The first time the leftovers were put in these small baskets, like a lunch pail kind of thing. The second time they were put in these giant bushels, you know, like this, you know, four feet tall off the ground. The first feeding was initiated by the disciples, if you remember. They had just crossed the, the lake and they wanted alone time with Jesus and there was 20,000 people there waiting to receive them. And the disciples were begging Jesus to get rid of the crowd so that they could finally have time to spend one-on-one -on -one with, with Jesus Christ. And, and the disciples used feeding the crowd as the ploy to get Jesus to dismiss them. Remember, they said, you have to send them home now. Otherwise, they won't have any place to eat out here. It was really a ploy by the disciples. I mean, they weren't more than three hours from, from their homes, most of them. The second feeding is initiated by Jesus. He's the one that starts it. He's the one that declares his compassion on, on the crowd. There's lots of similarities and differences between these two. But the main point of this miracle that we see in Mark 8 is really unveiled by looking at two of these principles, two of these points. There's one key similarity and there's one key difference. One key similarity and one key difference. And when you understand those two, the similarity and the difference, the meaning of this passage really opens up to us. First, the main difference, the main difference. The first feeding was to Jews. The second feeding was to Gentiles. And that really is the most critical difference between the two. Understanding that and all the other differences start to make sense. I mean, there were 20,000 Jews there because Jesus was a political leader. He was claiming to be the Messiah and the Jews wanted their Messiah to overthrow the Roman Empire. They had come out there in mass. John in John chapter six lets us know they were declaring that Jesus should be their king. They were ready to make him king by force. It was a massive political and popular uprising. All wanting Jesus Christ to be their leader. Which is obvious. I mean, he fed them food. The next day they chased him around. They wanted more food. I mean, who wouldn't want a, a government leader that could give you free food? So it was a Jewish setting. And that explains the other difference as well. The different fish. The Jews ate one kind of fish. They had it with them for lunch. The Gentiles ate a different kind of fish. They had that with them for their lunch that day. They had different kinds of baskets as the Jews carried their food in. The Gentiles would have, you know, used for their harvesting. So a lot of the differences are explained by that. Jesus gave a specific prayer and, and broke the bread in a specific way that was according to Jewish custom. In the first feeding, the second feeding, he just lifted it up and gave thanks and broke it and distributed it. So a lot of the differences are accounted in that. Why did he do the same miracle twice? You have to remember what the point of the first feeding was. Jesus was demonstrating for the disciples and for the world that he came to save people from their sin. He came to give them freedom for sin by giving his own body. Remember, he fed the, the 20,000 people and then he cut across the lake again and the whole crowd went around and received them the next day. They wanted to make him king. They were chanting for more food. And do you remember what Jesus told them? He said, you can only have eternal life if you eat my flesh and drink my blood. They wanted more of the, the mystical food that he had made yesterday. And now he's there talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. This is not what they signed up for. And everybody left. And there was left just the 12 disciples there looking at Jesus, scratching their head, thinking, I mean, this is, this is not a church growth strategy here. <laughs> Telling everybody to eat your flesh and drink your blood. And Jesus makes the point to them that he came to give his body to save people from their sins. He is the bread of life. 
Man does not live on bread alone, but lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is the word from the Father given to this earth. He is God in human flesh given to rescue people from their sin. The feeding of the 5,000 or 20,000 is a physical picture of that spiritual reality. That Jesus comes to save people. He comes to give himself. Spiritual food comes from Jesus Christ. And you cannot have salvation unless you receive that bread of life. Unless you participate in his death. Unless you're united to his death by faith. He is the shepherd of the sheep. He came to lay his life down for his sheep. He came to die for his people. And he comes to feed his sheep. He's not the shepherd that lays his life down for his sheep and stays dead. He's resurrected and then he feeds his sheep. He rescues them from their sin by dying for them. I mean, what a powerful metaphor that is. He is their sheep. He is their shepherd. He lays his life down to rescue the sheep. He dies in their place. The wrath of God is coming for the sheep to kill the sheep and the shepherd stands in the way and the shepherd is killed on behalf of the sheep and he is laid out dead. And the sheep live, but if the sheep just simply live, they scatter. Instead, the shepherd is resurrected and then he feeds his sheep through his word. This is the, the point of that feeding. It's to demonstrate that spiritual life comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from him, and he has no shortage of food to give. It comes from him. And he doesn't come only to rescue the sheep of Israel. Do you remember what he tells the disciples? I have sheep in this this flock, but I also have sheep in other flocks as well, in other pastures as well. In other parts of the world, I have other sheep, and I'm going to rescue them also. I'm going to bring them all together, and there'll be one flock Well, who are those other flocks? Where are those other sheep hiding? Well, they're all over the world is Jesus' point. This passage here before us in Mark 8, Jesus went to a Gentile territory. And I mean, the irony, the the feeding of the 20,000 that casts a shadow that keeps going. It it encompasses what we've seen so far. It's going to keep going the next few weeks. We're going to see the analogy from the feeding of the 5,000 continue to play out. Remember, he fed the the 5,000, the 20,000 really. And then the Pharisees revolted against him and wanted him dead. The Pharisees, remember the charge they brought against him? That he didn't ceremonially wash the food that he just created out of nothing before he gave it to the crowd. I mean, how absurd is that? (laughs) He made it out of nothing, but he didn't go through the ritualistic cleansing to make sure it was kosher. He invented it. He spoke it into existence and then distributed it to everybody. Of course it was kosher. But the Pharisees turned against him and they would have killed him. So Jesus fled and he went north. He went to Tyre, to Sidon, to Lebanon, to Syria, to Jordan, to Arabia. And he does this whole arch and then comes back to the opposite side of the Sea of Galilee, to the Decapolis. It was a 120 mile journey. It took him nine months to walk this distance. And the whole time he's accumulating these Gentile followers as he does this whole circuitous journey and his crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 4,000 we learned today. Everywhere he went, a few followers attached on. And it was different than in Israel. In Israel, it was a political movement. These people who are following him here, it's not for politics. They're not expecting him to overthrow Rome. They don't care that he's the Jewish Messiah. They care that he's doing miracles. They care that he's preaching the gospel. They're hearing the gospel preached. Do you remember the woman who came to Jesus a few weeks ago, earlier in Mark 7, and asked for healing for her daughter? And Jesus said, I didn't come for the Gentile dogs. I came for the house of Israel. And she said, yeah, but Lord, even the the dogs can eat the crumbs when the children reject it. This is that same principle here. He fed the Jews. He was rejected. He went to Gentile territory. And now he's doing the same miracle there. Two different people. And that really is the powerful point here. That Jesus comes not just to feed Jews. He's not only the shepherd of Israel. He's Israel's Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the Israelite scriptures, the Old Testament. But it's not only for Israel. 
The only way to go to heaven when you die, whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're in Capernaum or Tyre or the United States, the only way to go to heaven when you die is through belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through turning from your sins and receiving your spiritual life from him, partaking in his spiritual food, because he is the bread of life, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles alike. That's why he did the same miracle in two different groups of people to make that profound point. He is the savior of the world. That's the one difference that's key to this passage, to Jews and to Gentiles. Well, the one similarity that's key for this passage is the one group of people that saw both miracles, the disciples. This is Jesus' target audience here. He does the same miracle in this way to be a sign for the 12 apostles. They're the only ones that saw both miracles. He's the one, he's, they're the ones Jesus is doing this for. And that's obvious when you go through the text. If you look back at Mark 8 verse 1. In those days, those days is when Jesus was journeying through the Gentile lands. There was again a large crowd, which is becoming the custom wherever he goes. They had nothing to eat. Now notice, Jesus doesn't just feed the crowd. He's doing this for the purpose of the disciples. He calls the disciples together in verse one. And he says to them, I feel compassion for the people. That word compassion, it's a a very strong Greek word. It means, you know, we don't really have an English equivalent, but it means you are filled with so much concern for somebody that it feels like your spleen explodes. That's what the word literally means. The closest English equivalent might be heartbroken. You're heartbroken over someone, but heartbroken has the concept of of love in it. This word here in the Greek language, it's all about concern for someone. Jesus summons his disciples together and he says, I'm so concerned for these people. I'm so concerned I'm physically ill. He's physically afflicted out of concern for the Gentiles. And that would be stunning to the apostles. Remember, they rolled with it when he called them dogs a few days earlier, a few months earlier in the passage. They know that he's the savior of Israel and Jesus keeps driving home to them the point that he's the savior of the world. He has compassion on the Gentiles as well. That would have shocked the apostles. (laughs) He points out that these people have remained with him for three days now. So, I mean... I don't picture this feeding happening on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. There's the Decapolis there. There's the 10 cities that were made by Pompeii to be a testimony of Greek culture and Greek religion and the Greek gods on the bridge between Israel and Arabia. They're three days away from the closest city. They're out in that wilderness out there. And this crowd has been with him for those three days. And he has compassion on them because they haven't eaten. Jesus points out, I mean, they're in the wilderness. If I send them home, they are not going to make it. They will faint on the way. We're so far away, they'll faint. This is not like the fake concern of the disciples earlier with the first feeding. They're like, it's three hours away, Lord. You better get them going. (laughs) It's three days away to the closest market. And then Jesus says, some of them have come from a great distance. I mean, he's accumulated these people, not just from the Decapolis, from this entire trajectory all through the Gentile land. People have been gathered to him one or two at a time. And now by the end of this nine-month journey, he's got 4,000 of them out in the middle of nowhere. His disciples answer in verse four. Again, the focus on the disciples. Will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? Notice the disdain even in the disciples' voice. How are we gonna feed these people? What could possibly satisfy them? Now, we have it easy for us because we, I mean, this is only a few pages away from the last time he fed masses of people. So we've making the connection in our minds already. And I mean, if, if you wouldn't make it natural, you have the chapter heading in your, you know, NAS that tells you 4,000 fed. We know what's coming. The disciples didn't have that chapter heading. They say, how can you feed these people? Where are you going to get food? I don't think they're being sinfully stubborn here. I mean, there's been nine months since the previous feeding. They're out in the middle of nowhere. This sounds like daily conversation. I don't think Jesus is trying to trap them either. It's not like pop quiz, hot shot. Can I feed them or not? He just says, they're walking. He says, I'm filled with compassion for the masses because they don't have any food. That's normal conversation. And the disciples say, well, where can we possibly get food out here? They ha- they're not connecting it. They're not thinking he's going to feed everybody. And then Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? And I picture at this point the lights going on in their heads. <laughs> They've heard that question before. 
How many loaves do I have? Oh, wait, I think I've seen this movie once before. <laughs> seven becomes the answer. They have seven loaves of bread. So Jesus has everybody sit down. Remember with the Jews, he had them sit down by groups of 50 to make the connection to Moses. All the Jews would have got that. Moses had the people sit by groups of 50 in the wilderness. Jesus did it. All the Jews would have realized he's being Mosaic here. He doesn't have the Gentiles do that because the Gentiles don't know who Moses is. Much less that he had people sit down in groups of 50. They don't know Exodus. They don't know Deuteronomy. So Jesus has them all just sit down. With the seven loaves, he gives thanks to God. He breaks it. (laughs) Hands out the bread. Verse 7, some fish come forward. I mean, the crowd sees Jesus multiplying the bread and some people send forward fish. (laughs) We'll give him the fish too. And he does the same thing. He thanks the Lord for the fish and sends them out. Verse 8, they ate And we're satisfied. And what a stunning picture that is. Back up in verse 4. Remember with the disciples' question, their sarcastic question, who could possibly satisfy these people? Well, verse 8, the answer's there. Jesus can satisfy them. Everybody ate and everybody was satisfied. Mark uses the same word twice. Now, we know that they collect seven large baskets of what was left over. The first feeding... The 12 baskets was obvious. It was, you know, the apostles said, we don't have anything to feed people with. And they end each of them holding their own basket filled with food. The point is unmistakable. They were supposed to take Jesus' teachings to the world. Each of them, if they relied on Jesus Christ, would have enough to proclaim to the whole world. It's obvious why there were 12 baskets the first time. Why seven baskets here? You know, one idea would be that there's seven nations Israel was supposed to drive out. Probably seven nations Jesus walked through to get here. One basket for each nation. That's possible, seven churches in Revelation, possible. I'm not, I don't completely buy those as the main reason though. I think more likely, it's just that there were seven loaves to begin with. He started with seven loaves and the end of it, there's so much left over. There's one giant basket for each loaf that he started with. I think that's the, the more likely idea here. In other words, it's a profound demonstration of the fact that there is so much food. They started with seven pieces of bread and now they have seven bushels of bread. It was a profound miracle. 4,000 of them were there, and then he sent them away. The disciples could not possibly have missed this point. The point of the feeding of the 20,000 was that they were supposed to take Jesus' news to the world. In their mind, what does the world mean? Capernaum? Galilee? Maybe Jerusalem also? There's Pharisees there, but we'll brave it. All of Israel, is that what the world means? Jesus does this miracle and they have a public demonstration that no, when Jesus says that he has sheep all over the world, he's not just talking about Israel. He's the savior for the 12 tribes. He's also the savior for the entire world. They're supposed to, in the same way they had the baskets at the end of the first feeding, they're supposed to take Jesus' words to the entire world. Outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea, outside of Samaria, outside of Israel, all over the entire world. Across the Mediterranean to Rome, across the Atlantic to the United States. They are supposed to take the word of God everywhere. And it won't just be them that does it. It'll be people that, that learn the message from them. And so on and so on until Jesus becomes the savior of the world. Until the gospel goes around the whole globe. Until every nation hears, until every tribe hears, until every language group has the testimony in it, the gospel goes forward. That's the point of this. And believe me, the disciples got it. They got it. It's going to be driven home to them earlier. We'll see that in a few weeks. But remember Jesus' last words in the gospel of John, almost his last words to the apostle Peter? He says, Peter, do you love me? And he asked Peter that three times because Peter rejected Jesus three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter said all three times, you know I do. Do you remember Jesus' response? If you love me, feed my sheep. Feed them, Peter. Peter doesn't use the same answer from from these two stories. He doesn't say, we don't have any food. (laughs) How can you feed the whole world with you gone especially? No, Jesus gets it. You feed the sheep the word of God. Our Savior gave his life for us. He was the shepherd of the sheep and he laid down his life so that we won't have to go to hell when we die. 
He died for us to rescue us from sin. He took the sin that we deserve and he bore it in his own body and he was killed for it. And he offers his body as our spiritual food. And then he resurrects from the grave and he doesn't leave us. He doesn't let us scatter like sheep would. He gives us his word which ties us together. He gives us his word. It is the word of life. This is what Paul calls the the word of life, that he saves us through the washing of the water of the word. We are nourished by the word of God. That's why when we come together as a corporate body, we sing together. We have all of our collective voices singing the same words, raising our voices to heaven and proclaiming the same truth. We all feed on the same meal here. We all go to the word and have the same teaching from the word because we're one church with one shepherd, Jesus Christ, with one message, what his Bible says, and that becomes our spiritual food. We don't live off of bread alone, but we live off of what the Bible teaches us. We gather together for worship. We're saved through participating in his death, which is symbolically seen in communion, taking the the bread. It's symbolic. The bread represents that he laid his life down for us. But the bread also represents our common testimony, our common unity in the word. As we prepare our hearts now to receive communion, I want you, as you hold the bread in your hand, to think of those two points. As you look at the bread in your hand, think of the point that Jesus gave his life for us. He is the bread of life. He gave his life for us. You're not united with him by eating communion. You're united with him through faith. You participate in his death by being united to him through faith that he died in your place. But the second thing that bread represents is that we are united together under his word that we come together to eat and what we eat is the scripture. We're bound together. This bread doesn't just represent his death given for us. It also represents the, the commonality, the fellowship we have being in one body together. That's why we take communion as a group. That's why you don't take communion by yourself. I mean, first of all, you couldn't call it communion. But secondly, it represents our unity together bound underneath the word of God as one corporate body receiving the words of life through his word.